All right, and we are back. So Justin and I are ready to continue this mini series. For you guys, you know, every episode is released one week apart. But for us, you know, we kind of record a couple a week in short sequence, you know, like Sunday, Monday or something like that. And then we have a little break and then we continue. So it's been a while since I've talked to Justin. We are very excited to continue. I actually promised you guys at the beginning of the mini series that we would have, you know, some real meat and content. And we're really diving into that starting now. So thank you guys for setting the, setting the right mindset and bearing with us through those first few episodes where it may not feel like as much content, but it's just as valuable as this meat coming forward. So today we're going to talk about the team and definitely something Justin has a lot of experience with, and I'm excited to jump in. How are you doing, Justin? Good. G unit. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I guess we're, we're continuing the names, aren't we? Yeah, that's kind of going to be my thing, I think. Yeah. I've been, uh, every week I'm going to try to come up with another new G uh, nickname. So, you know, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to put in a short pen, short pun somewhere in that, uh, <laughs> in the mini series. There was a spot last episode, but I, I didn't do it. So I'm going to hold to... back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead and get started then. So we're going to talk about the team today. And one of the things that you talk about in your course is, uh, you have an exercise where you rate all of your team members on a scale of one to 10. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, that's one of the things I have all doctors do in the beginning. <clears throat> Just like you said, I have them rank um, all their team members from 1 to 10, 1 kind of being like they make my life a living hell to 10 if being, you know, if I had to go start a new practice tomorrow, I would want this person on my team. Um, and then we kind of go through and discuss and, you know, I kind of let them know, in my opinion, you don't want anything eights or below. You know, I, I think we can try to help six and sevens get to an eight or above. Um, but I think there's a limit to really how far you're going to move somebody. So I have my doc seriously consider immediately replacing or maybe even just getting rid of and not replacing anyone that's a five or below. Um, in a perfect world, I would say get rid of six and sevens too, but I'm a realist. I know that you know, we're not all going to go in our office and get rid of all our six and seven. So I'm fine with giving them a little time to rise to the occasion with you putting in the intentional effort with them. But you got to get that team moving and grooving at a higher level. So kind of, you know, when I go through this exercise, when I buy my office, um, I'm thinking, how do I rank them? You know, like what what's the difference between a six, a seven and eight a nine? You know, what what kind of things are you looking for and how do you give those rankings out? Um, well, I think it kind of depends on the practice, but for me, like, you know, I want somebody that, you know, is just really good. And what to me that means is they're a hard worker. Um, they have good interpersonal skills. They can talk to patients. They grasp, um, the vision and what we're trying to do with the office. Um, you know, just. And then there's, you know, even some intangibles, like just are they a right fit? They can be a great worker, um, a great person, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're the best fit um, for your office or my office. And, you know, really it comes down to your practice is only as strong as its weakest link. You know, if you have um, a weak link, you've got to let them go. It's not fair to the right people to keep the wrong people around. And the longer you wait, the longer you slow the growth of your practice. Yeah, absolutely. I it's find it funny, like you'll read on Dental Town, like these threads about, you know, staff management. And kind of one of the common themes you see is once you fire somebody, you wish you had done it sooner. Um, yeah. Is that something that you find to be true? Um, hundred percent. I mean, I actually, I was thinking this week as I was preparing for this, that I've never had an incident where a doctor let somebody go that we knew needed to go and they regretted it. You know, I've never, I mean, I've never even, I'm sure it's probably happened, but I've never even heard a story of someone saying, I knew I had this bad team member. I let them go and everything went to hell. You know, it's, it's usually the opposite. I myself <clears throat> have dealt with this firsthand. And when I took over my second practice, um, I had a team member that I knew didn't fit, but like most doctors, um, you know, I didn't want to go in day one. She, she had been with the practice longer than anybody. You know, I wanted to keep the continuity. Um, 
and I mean, honestly, I was scared. You know, I was scared. What if I let her go? She's been here a lot longer than I have. What if patients take off too? They get mad at me for letting her go um, or whatever. And, you know, it, it came down to all of my team issues that I had at that time revolved around this person in some way or another. And, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And I knew she wasn't a great fit, but she had been there longest. Um, bottom line is we let her go. I let her go. And production immediately jumped several hundred thousand that year. And I think we lost like 12 patients, most of which were just her really close girlfriends or family members. And, and I see that a lot, but we let our fear hold us back from making the decisions we know we need to make. And so. that's exactly the question I had for you was, you know, let's just say I buy this practice and I can say this because I haven't really met any of the staff, I've heard about them. Right. So if I come in and, you know, maybe one isn't a good fit, I, I feel like as a new owner, I would have that apprehension to make that change because as you said, you know, patients know them, everyone knows them. And then, you know, see my coming in, now they leave. It just, it, it kind of scares me a little bit. Sure. And I think it's very scary. And it really, it's scary whether you are brand new coming in or if you've been there for several years. Um, and, you know, I think you got to be wise about it. And I know you could get different opinions from different people. I probably, even if I knew someone wasn't a great fit, just buying a new practice, um, I'm probably not going to go in there day one and just get rid of them. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't fault someone if they if their opinion was to do that. Me, I want to kind of see the lay of the land. I want to really see, you know, and usually day one, you don't know 100%, you know, like what's their issue. You got to kind of learn things. You've got to build up some trust with the other team members because you're going to scare them. You're going to scare your good people if you go in day one not knowing 100% what's going on, you start letting people go. Um, so I think in some rare circumstances, that could be a situation that needs to happen. But, you know, I'm a realist again, and I think you got to kind of figure it out. And I say, the owner and the leader, you're the one that has to make the tough decisions. And here's the thing. Most doctors or dentists or owners of practices don't. They either don't make those tough decisions, they don't want to. Um, you know, I think most would prefer to just kind of bury their head in the sand or try to work on other things. Um, in my mind, it's kind of like giving a car a paint job when you really have a flat tire. Like, yeah, you're doing something. Um, you know, you want to focus on something to make yourself feel like, hey, I'm doing this. But at the end of the day, that's not what needs to be focused on. You got to focus on what's going to make the biggest impact. And a team member that cannot perform at the level you want to perform at, it's going to hold you back. Bottom line, I don't care what you say, it just will. I think that's a great point. And yeah, I'm absolutely with you. But then I also like what you said of understanding a situation and being, it's, it can be delicate sometimes and kind of trying to balance those two things. Sure. And so when you do have a six or a seven, you know, and you're trying to get them mm -hmm. to that eight, let's just say I walk in and, you know, I got a six and I'm like, okay, well, right. I'm brand new. I want to, you know, so how do you go about training your staff and making sure that, you know, you can't get the most out of your team? Yeah, I think it, be, it starts with just being intentional. You know, I think a lot um, <clears throat> of dentists, and I was, I've been there before myself, you know, you feel like if you keep working harder, if you just give it more time, um, if you personally as the doctor, if you try to do better, this person's going to try to do better, and, and they're just going to get better through osmosis. And bottom line is that usually is not the case. You have to be intentional. If you know, if people can't play at our level, they can't play in our team. And so for me, um, you know, I I often suggest uh, you know like making a list for a while. Um, when I first started out, really uh, in my second practice, I made a list for like two months of everything that I saw that wasn't going right, things that I saw with team members, anything that I saw needed to be improved. I didn't really harp on anybody. Um, I was still trying to build a relationship with the team, but I made my list of what I knew needed to be um, attacked. And then I was intentional. We sat down and we went through things one by one by one by one. And I showed them like, hey, this is an issue I see. This is what we need to get to. 
and let's work together and discuss how we're going to get from A to Z. You know, what really needs to happen? Not you're doing this, but you really need to do this. I showed them and worked with them. And this is how I want it done. This is, and let's talk about how you can be successful at that. Um, I also suggest, and I did this with my team, is going through books with your team. Two of my favorites to read with your team are The Nord, Nordstrom's Way and Raving Fans. And you know what I suggest is just have the doctor um, buy each team member one of the books, you know, give them a couple weeks or uh, a month to read it. And then you guys sit down and you discuss and go through the book and you maybe you'll break it up in a couple different sessions. But bottom line is the longer you put off having these hard conversations, the longer you're going to put off reaping rewards. And I think I see, I think there's a lot of people who put off reaping the true rewards they could have their entire career. So I'm a big believer in putting the work in early on. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't have to do all these things with my team um, as much anymore. You know, we, we front loaded the process when I first started uh, in my second office and we had a lot of work to do. I'd meet with them every week, then it was every month, then maybe every couple months, every quarter, every six months. Um, and now we meet, you know, once or twice a year tops. But it's because we front loaded the process and we put in extraordinary amounts of time in the beginning and then I don't have to do it the rest of my career. Um, but you know, I think you can, you can put in, you can go through your entire career with a team of fives, never reaching your full potential. Um, or you can put in the hard work now and reap the rewards the rest of your career. I like that, especially for an acquisition to kind of come in and you know, maybe silently lay, like we said, like get the lay of the land or like, you know, make your list of everything that you want to change. And then right. I'm, I'm sure you prioritize it, right? Where you kind of say like, you know, some things are more important than others and you start there or do you kind of just, you don't really. Um, yeah. I mean, you definitely, obviously in a practice, and I think we talked about this a little bit before is not everything has the same level of importance. So we're definitely going to prioritize and be wise, um, and I think number one, I usually tell my team or tell my clients, you know, take it seriously. And I often suggest starting off by apologizing, you know, apologizing, especially if you've been in that practice for a while and you've let crap go on that shouldn't have, you know, you've got to take back that respect and leadership. And I tell them apologize, you know, apologize for not being the leader you need to be for allowing some things to slide that holds the entire office back. And you know, let them know you're going to try to do better and then actually do better. Okay. So you apologize and you take responsibility and then you just kind of set the stage for the future. Um, yeah. So from there I just wing it. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, you know, I think number one, you've got to, you got to be humble. You got to be kind, but you have to be firm. You have to let them know that you're serious. Um, and this is a good time to remember your why. You know, why are you doing this? Why are you putting the time in? Why are you doing these, having these conversations that are not fun? Um, you know, they're a pain in the butt and sometimes, honestly, they're awkward. Um, but I like to kind of just, you know, when I had my conversations with my team, I took it seriously. I planned out my delivery just like I was teaching a class. Um, that's how serious I took it. I had handouts for them. Um, I kind of started off by giving them the detailed big picture. Um, and, you know, then we just work through things one by one. Um, and I think these conversations and these times with your team um, are what end up determining, you know, if you take off two weeks a year or eight weeks a year. You know, if you bring home 200000 or you want to bring home 600000 And bottom line is training your team adds value to them. It shows you care. Um, it shows that you respect them. They may not love it. You know, just like my kids, when I um, have to discipline them, you know, they don't like it, but they know that dad cares about them and dad's just not going to let them do whatever the stupid stuff they want to do. Um, you know, it shows them that you care. And I also tell my team, you know, when I'm having to talk to you about certain things, it's because I want you around long term. And I feel that you are going to be around long term. And I tell them, you know, it's the times that I don't say anything to you, you know, that you need to be more concerned. So, um, 
you know, you got to help your team buy into the dream and the cream's going to rise to the top. I really like that last part where you tell them, you know, you're only doing this because you're invested in them as a long-term fit in the practice. Right. And it's true. I mean, I, um, there was, I had a lot of hygienists go, you know, a little while ago, I had one leave. Um, we, I don't offer insurance, health insurance. Her husband had health insurance, but he was going to go back to school. So she had, um, uh, another part-time job where they wanted her to come on full-time, but she wouldn't, but they offered health insurance. So she left, hired someone else, you know, and I started off strong with her and we were going through things, but I could tell pretty soon that she just wasn't going to be the the best fit that I thought she was going to be. And, um, you know, before too long, I was like, I, I quit pointing out things. I quit working with her and when I finally had to let her go and I told her, she's like, I kind of expected it because it's like your feedback and, um, everything had definitely tapered off. So, and to add to that story, my original hygienist came back. So even without health insurance, she realized we had a good thing going and she ended up coming back. So it all worked out well, but the thing is, you know, it's, it's truth. I'm not blowing smoke at them. I'm going to pour into the people who I want with me long term. So I like that. And you kind of alluded to a subject that I kind of want to dive into a little bit more. We talk about hiring, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe you thought that hygienist was a great fit, but turned out not to be, you know, what is your philosophy on hiring and how do you do it to ensure that you get great team members, eights, nines, tens? Um, You know, I think it's no matter what you do, I think you got to do your best and then uh, see how it plays out. I don't think there's any foolproof, uh, 100% guaranteed, like, this is the way you're going to get the perfect fit for your office. But let me kind of run you through what I do to to give it our best shot, essentially. Um, I think number one is I make it very hard to get hired at our office. I make it hard to get hired. And once you're hired, it's also hard to be let go. Um, I involve my team and you know, for me, I haven't had to do this a ton. I haven't had to hire a lot because um, I keep a small team. And for the most part, my team has always stayed with me. But, you know, I'll put an ad on Craigslist. Um, for me, that's just what I do. I'm older um, and I'm pushing 38 and a half next month. So that's probably why I still use old school Craigslist. So I know there are other cooler sites out there now, but I put in my ad, you know, I kind of tell them exactly what I'm looking for. I tell candidates, um, that we work very hard in our office. That's kind of always my main thing. Like everyone has their priority list, um, of what they like in employees. Like to me, I like someone who is willing to work hard because when I'm at the office Monday through Wednesday, I like to work hard. Um, so that's, that's, just kind of my go-to and then I'll list, you know, other things we're looking for. Um, I kind of mentioned the hours, but how the process works is I receive all the resumes to my email first. You don't have to do this. You could have someone else in your office do it. This is how I like to do it. I like to receive all the resumes and then I start weeding them out. Um, I'll look them up online. I'll look them up on Facebook. I'll go through if there's any misspelled words, they're gone. Um, if there's things that I asked for that I wanted, um, like a certain type of experience in the ad and they say they don't have it, I discard it. Um, so I'm pretty liberal with weeding out the resumes. So then once I get them narrowed down, um, you know, I may get a hundred resumes and I'll send, let's say maybe two or three, um, to five, maybe to my front desk and then she goes through them and she weeds them out. Does the same process I did essentially. See if I missed anything, see if she sees something that I did not. And then once we get it down to a low number, get them in and my whole team interviews them together without me. And I tell them to be tough because they're the ones, they know what it takes in our office. Um, They know we have something special and they want to protect it. And, you know, it gives them ownership both during the interview process and after the interview process. I mean, if they all said this person's great and we get that person in the office and they suck, like I'm going to be looking at them and be like, you know, 
the heck was going on? Um, <clears throat> I tell them to look for, you know, just demeanor, attitude, appearance, all the normal things, um, and that they're a good fit. And they'll run them through the gauntlet. You know, I don't have, you know, I wouldn't say they're mean about it, but I, like I said, I want it to be hard to get a job at my office because I don't want to go through it again. It takes time. Um, it's not fun. Uh, and it's, to me, it's just bad for business. I think if you're constantly rotating through things, it's hard to grow. And I actually, this is a funny story. I had, um, this is a total random tangent. I had a practice last week or a patient last week. She came in for, uh, a consult where she wanted to do, you know, like veneers up top or something. And, I went in and was like, nice to meet you. I was like, have you been here before? And she said, yeah. I was like, oh. And I was like, and then I, I just couldn't place her. I'm like, uh, it's like, did we meet? And she said, no, I was actually, I came in for an interview. Uh, oh, when man. I had that whole high jumps thing. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, it was slightly awkward. Uh, and we made the best of it. But, you know, I think everything counts. So I think, you know, to me, even though she didn't get hired, which is a huge slap to your pride, slap in the face, I'm sure it would be, I don't know if I could have gone back um, after that. Not that it was a personal thing on her, but, you know, it just hurts your pride a little bit. And, but I think that it shows that everything counts. You know, even though she didn't get hired, she knew when she came in for the interview that something was different about our office. Um, and, you know, it, it made me feel good. I was glad she did, and I thanked her for that, and et cetera, et cetera. I still think, I mean, she's a great person, very nice, but I, I knew just by our conversation during the council that my team made the right decision. She was not a great fit for office, nothing personal on her. Um, she just wasn't the right fit. So it just it made me feel good in the process that it worked to some extent. And kind of the last thing um, – well, after they interviewed, um, I don't want to skip ahead. After my team interviews, you know, they'll usually the couple, three candidates gets narrowed down to maybe zero, maybe one, maybe two, whatever. Then I meet them and uh, I kind of do my own interview and just really, I'm looking for a feel. I mean, obviously they have the qualifications that they've made it that far in the process, but I just want to get a feel for them. Um, so I don't necessarily ask them a ton of tough, tough questions, but I just really want to get to know them. Um, and see if they're the right fit. So a little bit of it's gut, I'm not going to lie. So and the bottom line, after I'm done with that, I ask myself, and this is, for me, it's kind of my litmus test. Would I be upset if this person went and worked for the office right across the street? You know, would I feel that I lost out? Would it make me nervous that they've got this treasure of a worker and we missed out? Um, and if it's yes, then I probably want them on my team. And if it's, eh, doesn't really bother me, I can live without them, then that tells me they're probably not the best fit. That is very interesting. Wow, I really yeah. liked hearing about that process. Thanks. It was, uh, it was probably time to wrap up the uh, interview at this point, isn't it? That was, a, that was quite the speech. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Um, I got a question for you, Justin, though. Um, when you're, Let's just say your team gives you an individual... Um, or gives you a couple where they feel like this is a really great candidate. Does it ever happen where you're like, mm, I guess that, that litmus test maybe. So how do you go about, is it o overall your say at the end of the day, even though they yeah. gave you their recommendation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, hundred percent at the end of the day, like I may not use my veto power a lot. I may not use my executive power, but you know, it's my office. My name's on the loans. Um, it's my life. It's my name on the school loans. It's my child's education I have to pay for. So the buck stops with me with everything. And I don't say that, you know, with pride or arrogance. But, you know, I feel like I'm responsible for the office. I'm responsible for my employees. I'm responsible for my family um, on down the line. Um, so, yeah, if they sent me, you know, they sent me, they could send me three three applicants and said, Hey, these three are amazing. 
Um, you got to interview these and we'll pick one, blah, blah, blah. And I, it's very possible that I could, I'd have no hesitation interviewing those three and being like, you know what? No, that's, that's not going to cut it. Um, so, and I think they understand that. And rarely do I have to use that. Um, I don't, I hate to use the word power, but you know, usually what they do is more than acceptable. But if I ever needed to, I would not hesitate saying no, um, Let's let's go through this process again. Those, those were not the right fit, because if not, it's going to end up costing me time, money, and frustration in the future. I'd much rather be honest now um, than have to deal with this issue either ongoing or down the road sometime. I like that. I think that's kind of a theme. If if our listeners haven't captured it yet, I do want to point it out. Where um, front loading the process, doing more work up front to do less work later. Um, you know, cause right now it's just the rehiring process, but then, you know, if you do hire the wrong fit, then it's the firing, then the re-screening, then the hiring and retraining. So I think kind of one thing I've noticed as you're going through this, and I think you would agree with me is that there is this theme of doing more work now and it'll lead to more benefit later and less hassle and work. And so on that same token, you know, when you do hire somebody, and they come into your office and you see behavior that you maybe not don't like or something like that. How do you go about training it and all that? And then also your comments on that point of, you know, kind of your theme of doing more work now to do less work later. Is that something you'd agree with? Yep. Um, hundred percent. Um, I'm definitely big on front loading the process. I'm definitely big on putting, um, extraordinary amounts of effort and energy and time in the beginning so that I can have extraordinary amounts of rewards and time on the back end. Like I said, I know I put in um, more time probably in the first year working with my team, getting things in place um, than some doctors do their entire career. Um, it doesn't make me better. Um, it just makes me different, you know, and it's paid off. And now, you know, I because of that work, because of taking the things head on that most would just like to ignore, just deal with or um, just allow to continue, because I think that's human nature. You know, it's some of these conversations I've had to have um, are awkward. They're not fun to have. Um, But it's what's given me a practice that does what my practice does nowadays. You know, I leave at five o'clock on Wednesdays on the week that I the weeks that I work. And I honestly usually do not think about my practice again until Monday morning at 9 a.m. Um, and that didn't, that did not, and it does not happen by accident. Um, you know, it was a hundred percent by design and a hundred percent due to putting in the work in the beginning. Um, and then your other question was, about How do I addressing handle behavior? It? Uh, right. Um, addressing behavior. So I think number one, I never let subpar behavior go unaddressed. Um, you know, it, it goes back to, I think, something that we touched on again in the last episode. You know, if you're constantly telling your team the good things that they're doing, um, it makes telling them the harder things easier. And I 100% believe in keeping short accounts. Do you um, keep it short? Yeah. Um, keeping short accounts, not necessarily like sometimes my feedback short, sometimes my feedback to them is long, but I don't let it continue. Um, you know, if I notice something, you know, let's say someone comes in late um, and there was really, you know, there wasn't an accident or something funky that they just had no control. There's, you know, I'll call them in my office right away and say, hey, what's the deal? You know, you know, we started this time, you know, I need you here. Um, you know, and they'll say, you know, they'll give me the reason. I'll say, hey, let's not let it happen again. And I send them out loving them just as much as I did when they came in. But I don't let it fester. I don't let it cause strife um, in our office. Because when you have a, you know, I'd say small team, but really any size team, like everyone in the office knows, even if they're not involved, if two people are having an issue, like you can just, Feel it. You can just cut it with a knife and it affects everything else in your office. I don't let that crap go on in my office. Um, you get what you tolerate. If you tolerate bad behavior until it snowballs on you, then you've got an issue. 
And honestly, I'd say you've had an issue the entire time that snowball was building, whether you noticed or not. You have to nip things in the bud early, um, and you've got to be intentional. I like that. What I got from that is that you keep it short. <laughs> I'm just giving yeah. you a hard time. That's my pun that I was waiting for. Yeah, why don't you just leave those to me, George? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's nicer than a lot of the short jokes I've heard uh, my whole life. So I appreciate that. You took it easy on me. All righty. So, but, you know, kind of to sum things up, you know, I don't want to derail from the content, but, you know, I think you, you get what you tolerate is kind of a good baseline to go by where, you know, you don't tolerate anything you're not willing to have every day in your office. Right. And so we kind of went through it last time where that the interaction with the employee and you kind of went over it again, where you kind of, you just assure them that, you know, they're a valued member of the team and that nothing's going to, you know, spill over. And then you just kind of tell them what you need, they need to hear. And then you move on. Is that kind of a good summary of how that interaction goes? Yeah. I think it, it helps them too, because it gives them, um, confidence. You know, they're, they're never worried of where they stand in my eyes. They know that if I have an issue with them, they know I'm going to address it right away. Um, you know, and there's even times when they know, like when I'll say, Hey, so-and-so, can you come in my office for a minute? They just know. And they're like, Oh boy, what did I do? Um, and, but they know that I'm going to handle it. They know we're going to discuss it and they know that I'm not going to hold a grudge and that I'm going to care for them. Like it never, I just, they're good enough where they know that I expect them that once it's, we discuss it, that it's handled. I'm not going to continue to beat them up about it. I'm not going to hold it over their head. If we talk about it. I let them know it's expected. I trust that they're good enough that they'll take care of the issue and we leave, you know, just as good as we were before. So, and it keeps things on an even keel in my office. And I even give you an example here. Um, you know, I kind of gave you this, the random example of, uh, or the generic example of someone coming in late, how I would handle it. But here's, was a real life one, um, you know, that wasn't, that we had to have a talk not too awful long ago. Um, and it was slamming drawers. And it wasn't intentional, but I noticed if we got in a hurry or if we were running behind by a few minutes, one of my assistants, she would, things would start to get a little bit louder. It wasn't, she was, she wasn't upset. She was just moving a little bit faster and, you know, slamming the, the drawers. So I had to call her in my office and explain, you know, we may be in a hurry, but we never let the patient know or feel that. So I'm just letting you know that I noticed it. So the patient's probably feeling it. So if you just wouldn't mind, um, will you try to watch that for me? And yeah, no big deal. And then, you know, what I think a lot of dentists, not everybody, but a lot would in their mind think, gosh, dang, why does this assistant slam in these drawers all the time? And, you know, and just let it build up until they're, you know, kind of getting ready to explode. But I don't. And it keeps our relationships, um, not that we never have issues, but it keeps things in check in our office. I kind of use the example of just kind of going back to that rushing as a symphony um, in the course. You know, if you if you ever go to the symphony, which I don't a lot, um, but I have been there. And if you look at any one musician, you see like they're feverishly working their instrument, like they're going at it. Um, but if you look at it either as a whole, or you, even if you close your eyes, like you don't see any here. All you hear and see is this beautiful music. I tell them that's what I want my patients to see. That's what I want them to see. We may all be rushing, doing our thing, working hard, but all I want our patients to see is the beautiful music, the beautiful symphony going on. So that's my example for the day. Yeah, that was no, I didn't know where that was going to go, but that was, that was good. Yeah, thank you. I kind of pulled it back there at the end. So I wrote something down on my notes here when I was going through your course, and you kind of alluded to it in the hiring process where you look your applicants up on social media and then mm -hmm. in the um, course you say that you friend them on social media um, right. your, your friend your staff and I'm, right. I'm curious about that um, why you would do that I mean I, I'm not opposed to it either way but I just it, it was interesting to me I thought maybe we could yeah. talk about it well 
it's uh it's actually less provocative than how you make it sound um you know, like you print your staff but <laughs> um you know the reason i do it is because i want to keep tabs anybody who's related um or associated with my office i want to keep tabs on it um i don't check it every day i mean i don't check it every month um but I want to know what they're putting out there for the world to see, because at the end of the day, they are a representative and ambassador for my office. And I've got big, high goals for my office. And again, another kind of common theme that you may pick up on is that I think everything counts. And if they're out there cursing, um, you know, showing pictures of them puking in the bushes after going out some night or, uh, you know, political rants or, uh, what's another one, you know, kind of talking bad, like, oh crap, it's Monday again, blah, or, you know, Tuesday afternoon, they're posting, can't wait till Friday. You know, to me, none of those things talks good about my office. Is it a little thing? Yeah. Um, but everything counts. Um, you know, they're representing this office, our office in everything they do. And if they can't understand how everything works together, um, then, you know, they're probably not the right fit for my office. You know, we we're trying to be different and it comes down to even social media. So they're putting crap out there. It's, it's not going to last. I think I've had to have one conversation about it one time. Um, you know, and I get the argument. They could say, hey, you know, like, this is private. It's after work. I can do what I want. Like, you sure can. Go do it for someone else's office, pretty much is what I would say. Um, but I had to have one conversation with them, and they understood. And I've never had another one. But that's what I do it. That's why I do it. Yeah, I was going to ask if you've ever heard it's actually come up where something's happened. So, Interesting. Anyway, we'll, yeah. we'll go back into the topics. Okay. So you talk about kind of, you know, that constant feedback, and we talked about not letting things go on that you're not willing to tolerate on a daily basis. But right. then what happens, like, do you do, like, quarterly reviews with your staff or, you know, monthly, or how do you handle your staff evaluations? Um, I don't. I don't have, like I said, we're going to meet every three months. We're going to meet every six months. Um. I just don't because I'm evaluating all the time. If I see something, I'm not going to wait for three months. I'm not going to wait for six months. I'm going to talk to you right then and we're going to improve right then and we're going to move forward right then. Um, I'm not scared to address things um, as they come up and need to be addressed uh, because I built that culture in my office. Again, it didn't happen day one. Um, and sometimes, you know, especially if that's extra hard for you. I mean, we all have things that, that aren't, Fun to do, but they're easier for some and less easy for others. If you need to do that, then I'd say, you know, just start off with planning a 15 minute meeting or 10 minute meeting with each team member once a month or once every two months um, to kind of give yourself an out of like, uh, you know, this is on the book. So we kind of have to go through this until you're comfortable with it. Um, in my office, I don't give like a, a I don't have like, every year you get a raise or every six months you get a raise. Our raises are based upon our bonuses. Um, so I don't use them for that. And like I said, I evaluate all the time. Once, um, once you're done, you know, I think the hard work and getting everybody rowing in the same direction, you know, I like to focus more of my times on asking them, you know, what they see that can be improved. Um, how can we make things get even better in our office as opposed to, okay, we have this time set apart. Let me run through all the crap that I see that's happened the last six months. So, you know, that's where I'm at. I make my ex expectations clear at all times and the clarity that I provide them gives them confidence to do the job correctly and do it at a high level. I like the clarity part. I also I think that also gives them maybe a sense of security where they know what's expected 100%. of them. So they know, you know, job security would be pretty good if they're doing what you need to do. Right. Yep. Another thing that you talk about in the, the lecture was cross training. 
And um, I kind of wanted you to elaborate on that. It's not something we hear very often. Yeah. So personally, I use a pretty small team, um, especially for the amount of dentistry that we produce. So it's imperative. We're cross-trained. You know, every everyone knows how to answer the phone. Um, hygiene, if they don't have a patient or they get done with their patient and I need to jump to another room and I need someone, they'll come over and assist me. They will jump in and get a patient numb. My front desk will seat patients. There's no... Um, I'm done with my patient, so I'm heading out to lunch, or I'm done with my patient, so I'm going to go chill in the break room kind of thing. We definitely, and it's a process, and we work on it all the time, but there's an all-for-one and one-for-all mentality in our office. There's no, this is your job, um, this is my job, I'm just going to focus on my job, and if you're running behind or having a tough time with yours, that's you, um, you know. We have to work on a team if we're going to accomplish the goals we set out to accomplish. And, you know, everyone needs to know to do as much as they possibly can within the legal limits um, to help out in other areas. So so then how do you kind of hold staff accountable? Um, do you kind of have a core duties are assigned to certain people and then you, you guys kind of all help each other out? Um, well, I think... You know, later in the course, I don't know if it's later on this uh, section or not, but on jobs, you know, like I definitely will have, as far as delegating responsibility, like one team member is ultimately responsible for this, you know, maybe scheduling, maybe ordering, maybe recalls, maybe cleaning, like each of them, you know, so-and-so is responsible for it, but just because so-and-so is responsible for it doesn't mean that you jump in um, and doesn't mean you don't jump in and help them. Uh, so how do I hold them responsible? I mean, really, it's kind of a, a self-policing policy. And, and because the girls, I mean, we only have five ops. We're a fairly small office. We can all see each other. Like, we know who doesn't have a patient, who's not busy at the moment. And if they're not jumping in to help, like, you know, they're going to get lynched. No, they're not really. But everyone, <laughs> everyone knows, uh, like, that's just it. I mean, it's it's tough to explain. Like, I don't sit there and, like, over them with a whip. Like, it's a culture that we've built. And they know that if so-and-so's running behind and they're empty, they just know. I go help so-and-so until they're done. And then we all go to lunch or we all get caught up. Um and bottom line is, if you can't figure that out, if you don't understand that and can't execute on that, you're not going to be, you're not going to last on our team very long. That's just how we roll. I like how you said the word culture. I think you're, it's a perfect word to describe kind of what we're talking about. Having yeah. that culture of, you know, all for one, one for all. Yep. And then kind of to wrap up this topic, um, how do you train your staff to interact with patients the way that you, I know it's something that you really, you know, care about. How do you, you know, talk to them about that and make sure that they're interacting with them appropriately? Right. Um, you know, I think this is one of the best investments dentists uh, can make in time and money uh, inside your office. I want my team to be just as good as I am. Um, and if they're better, that's awesome. At talking to patients uh, about treatment. I want them, when they see the normal things that patients present with, cracked teeth, open margins, recession, calculus, decay, whatever, I want them to feel good enough um, to be able to take a picture, explain to the patient what they're looking at, and then give a heads up of what I'm going to suggest to remedy that problem and why I'm going to suggest that. Um, I think your team needs to know you're kind of your basic criteria for different treatments. Some of it will come with time. Um, some of it you may just be uh, forward enough to write them down. Like, hey, if a patient presents with this criteria, you can be, you can rest assured, I'm going to come in and treatment plan this. They present with this, you know, I'm going to come in and talk about this. Um, you know, I, and that happens because, again, um, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I was intentional in the beginning. I spent time with them 
pulling up patients' pictures or um, if we had five minutes after a patient left their hygiene appointment, hey, let's come over here and look at this picture. Um, what would you say to this patient? I pull up a picture, patients, it's got a big crack there. No pressure, you know, let's just work through it. What would you say to me if I showed up with that, that going on? Um, and they know one thing, and again, this is, this is just a, a small thing, but if they're not sure on what I'm going to suggest, you know, let's say the tooth is right on the borderline of needing a filling or needing a crown, they know if they're on the borderline to talk to the patient about a crown. And the reason is that if I come in and I suggest a filling, you know, that I look like a hero. Um, you know, you know, Mrs. Smith, I think you're on the borderline, but I really think we can knock this out with a crown Oh, or with a, a filling. Oh, great. You know, Amanda talked to me about a crown and I was kind of not looking forward to that. So, and then if I don't get to look like a hero, they're already prepared um, for the crown. And, you know, and I'm not saying be illegal. We know that hygienists cannot diagnose and we know that the prisons are filled with hygienists who have diagnosed cavities. Uh, so we don't want that going on. But with your team, you have to be clear on, well, I think I, I won't continue on on that subject. I mean, I think that, did I answer the question? Yeah, I, I think we did a good job hitting that point pretty good. And I think that kind of goes back to just that overarching theme again of having an intentional purpose for everything you do and then having it, you know, reap the rewards later. So I think we covered that very nicely. Good. And then the other thing that I wanted you, oh, I also wanted to mention one other thing on that subject is yeah. I like your style of um, teaching as you go, training as you go. And, you know, like you think like teach your staff how to diagnose, you know, you, you know, back my mind, I'm thinking, are we all going to sit down, like during lunch and talk about this stuff? It's like, well, no, you're just going to kind of do it throughout your day and, you know, teach them as you go, as things come up. And I, I like that style about you kind of all the time where you always talk about just, no, no need for a formal staff evaluation. I'll just evaluate them all the time. I'll teach right. them all the time. And I think that's very Thank valuable. Thank you. And I think the nice part about that is the more you do that, the longer you've done that, the less you have to do it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're intentional about it all the time, you know, I don't, you know, my hygienist have been with me for several years now. I don't, I'm not having those same conversations. I'm not spending those same five, 10 minutes here, um, five, 10 minutes there kind of thing. And it makes my life better. And I think that's kind of goes back to the whole lifestyle practice philosophy. I don't want to be stressed out with the little details um, my entire career. You know, I want my team to be good enough where we put in the work in the beginning and now everybody knows what we're doing and we're moving forward as a team. And I think one, uh, you know, another little just small detail, I think, with your team is you've you've always got to be clear between what's a suggestion and what's required. Um, for example, at one point a couple of years ago, I suggested to my hygienist, hey, why don't we start offering fluoride to adult patients? Um, ADA recommends it. I think it's good. I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't do it. Let's do it. Okay, we'll start doing that. But it was they took it as that. They took it as just a suggestion because that's what it was. Um, they kind of took it as, eh, if it's convenient, if it gets brought up, we'll do it. If not, no big deal. So I saw what was happening. I saw it wasn't really getting done to the level in my mind that I wanted it done. So I explained to them, hey, instead of, just doing it sometimes, this is just going to become a part of every exam. Um, every We don't cram it down patients' throat. We don't pressure them. We offer it to them. We let them know the benefits and why we offer it. And if they take it, great. They don't, they don't. But we're going to do it with every patient, period. And within that week, I think even like the next day, our fluoride sales jumped instantly like 30% just by making that real small um, pivot or whatever you want to call it in how I delivered it to my team. Another, another example of that is review and referral cards. 
um, you know, we had talked about before, like, hey, we need to get more referrals. We need to start talking, asking people for reviews when that stuff was all becoming hot. You know, it's been several years now. And they're like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll start doing that. And then it happens sometimes because it's my fault. You know, I kind of, I didn't make it mandatory. I didn't tell them this is what's expected. I said, hey, you think this is a great idea? Do it. Um, and now we just made that part of every hygiene exam. Hey, you know, we'd love for you to give us a review. It really helps us. Or if you have any friends and family, we would love to have them. Um, and we'll even send you a $25 gift card for saying thank you for sending them in. But bottom line is if you're not clear about what's ex- what is expected, don't expect it to get done because um, you're wasting your time. If you make it clear and then it doesn't get done, then you've got an issue that needs to be addressed. But definitely know there's a difference between suggestions and sitting down with your team and letting them know what's required. Yeah, I think Rant that's... over. No, that that was definitely worthwhile. I was really enjoying that. And I think for us as new owners, um, you know, myself and maybe a lot of our listeners, I think that's very valuable because those small nuances in communication can make a big difference. Yeah. And one other thing, right before we wrap up this topic about team and staff, you, you do mention in your um, lecture that you'd like to keep your team overhead at 20%. And for our listeners who know, because we do a lot of valuation and all those things, that's on the lower side for sure. Right. So how do you right. do that? Um, bottom line, George, and I know this is going to sound uh, kind of ignorant and it's not supposed to be, is I just do it. It's not an option. It's not negotiable for me. When I started off with my um, coach like 11 years ago, 12 years ago, um, this is what he suggested, suggested. And it wasn't easy, but it, to me, it makes a ton of difference. And to me, this is one of my cornerstones. Um, not that you have to do it. But I can tell you, I actually had a conversation with a dentist this week, and they knew that I had preached keeping your team overhead at 20%. And they said, hey, I work with so-and-so consultant, and they said to keep it at, you know, 25%. Um, And they didn't like the idea of keeping it at 20%. I was like, why? You know, tell me this, person, like, which is netting you more at the end of the day? do you net more of your team overheads at 20% or 25%? And they're like, well, obviously 20%. I'm like, yeah. Is it easier or harder to keep your team overhead at 20% versus 25%? And I said, well, it's harder to keep it lower. I'm like, do you think, you know, if your goal is to get dentists to sign up and like your philosophy and feel good about working with you, do you think more dentists want to hear that, They can keep their team overhead at 25% or 20%. And, you know, dentists, no one wants or very few want to be made to feel uncomfortable. You know, so if they join a program that says, hey, you should keep it at 25% and they're at 27, 28, they're like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. If I'm telling them they should get it down to 20%, um, you know, and if you end up hitting 22%, 23%, whatever, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily the letter of the law. It's the principle behind it. it it's going to make a big difference in your net income. Um, you know, I think average is around 30% for most offices because most offices need more people around or they think they need to produce higher numbers. But I can tell you my team of five tens is going to outperform your team of eight fives all day long. And I'm going to put a lot more in my pocket because of it, because I'm paying three less people. And probably most, um, the dentists listening or dental students listening, if you don't know it, um, you should. Team overhead is your biggest expense. It's going to be your biggest line item. So if you're trying to keep overhead in check, you might be able to lower your supply budget, let's say 5%, if you really work at it. But how much effect is that 5% of, let's say, 60000 for a year really going to make at the end of the day? If you have a million-dollar practice and you can get or you can keep your team overhead at 20% instead of 30%, you just save yourself $100,000 that goes right into your pocket. And, um, you know, my practice this year, 
on collectible fees will do between 1.6 and 1.7. And I can tell you our team overhead will be almost exactly 20%. And when you can keep your total overhead at 50 to 60% and you're increasing production and other things are moving in the right directions, that's when things start to get magical. That's when you can start to cut back time. That's when you're making a lot more money. Um, and that's really when your lifestyle starts to change and improve. Um, and the ways that you can do that, um, you know, and I, and I don't say everybody who signs up with me, I'm like, okay, you've got a month to get your team over at 20%. I get it. I'm a realist. It's not going to happen. Um, but we do look and we look and see if there's areas we can trim the fat. We look at, see, if, you know, we always look at increasing production because that's going to dilute it. Um, sometimes people have to let go of team members. Um, <clears throat> not often. I mean, I get it. That's, that's one of the hardest things to do. Most dentists are not willing to do that. Some are and they reap the benefits, but I get it if not everyone is. And you just do it. Quit making excuses on letting your team make excuses of why you can't do it. Um, and I feel that, you know, a, a practice producing a million dollars a year doesn't need more than three or four team members to do it. Um, not that I'm going to say you're horrible if you have more, but I know at the end of the day, like, you don't have to have more than that. I know it can be done because I've done it. I've done it with, um, I think we hit 1.2, between 1.2 and 1.3 with three team members. So I know you can hit a million with four if you're doing the right things and have other things in line. And if you do, you're going to reap the rewards because you're going to put more in your pocket and it's going to give you more freedom. Yeah, well, I don't think there's a better place to end. This was absolutely fantastic, and um, I'll see you guys next Tuesday. I hope you guys really enjoyed that episode. I really did, and I could not have thought it was more valuable than it was. So thanks, Justin, and we'll see you again next week. You're welcome, G-Unit. Thank you.